Well, I'm here with some friends, Ron Silliman. Hi, Ron. Hello. Anna Strong Safford. Hello. Julia Block. Hello. And Tracy Morris. Hi. Hi. We're here to talk about a poem, a relatively new poem by Ray Armentrout from her book, Finalists. The poem is called Count. And Julia, I wonder if you could read it and then we'll just talk about it. Count. One, the future is a sweetener. Children have to learn to crave. Two, as cushy clouds in full sun are taken to betoken. So Anna and then Ron, Ray writes poems in sections. Mm -hmm. Sometimes she will divide the sections by asterisk or some other. Sometimes she'll number them. Sometimes there are three, sometimes four, often two. So Anna, when you read a Ray Armentrout poem and you know that there are two sections and typically they don't immediately or obviously relate, what do you do? How do you deal with it as a reader? Is it juxtaposition? Is it two different stories that either do or don't have a connection? What do you do? Oh, it depends on the Ray poem. I think usually what I try to do is find, and I found this to be true in a lot of cases, that one might be a slight revision or slight, like, slight, Restatement? Restatement iteration of the other. Mm -hmm. And I think that might work for this poem because of that word as. Mm -hmm. The word as to me is suggesting a kind of comparison or a link. Example yeah. of, for example. Yep. Okay, that works there. Yeah. Now how it actually yeah. is that, I'm not sure. I'm still working on that. Ron, this is a general question for you. And then I'll ask Tracy and Julia to get into the relationship of these particular stanzas. No one knows or reads more Armentrout off the presses than you. You're, you're often getting a new, a new poem. So tell, how do you read these section-based poems? How have you learned to read them? I, it has been a process of learning over the decades, actually. I've known Ray for 50 years. Um, and I, today, I, I didn't know the name David Sally when I first met Ray back in, when she was a student of Denise Levertoff's uh, at, at Berkeley. Um, I didn't know his work at all, but often I, his work, which comes in diptychs and triptychs and with multiple images juxtaposed that don't necessarily, quote, go together, unquote. Right. One learns to look at all of that um, and absorb the different pieces. With Ray's pieces, I'm shocked if I think the second part or third part of a sequence um, appears to follow a straight line. I always see these as though they're the asterisk or the number is some kind of hinge mm -hmm. uh, taking me in a completely different direction, but often using the same tools or to the same place. Mm. Oh, I can't wait to ask this hard question of Julia Block that follows from what Ron is saying. Um, the title count can mean, boy, it means five or six things. Is it possible that one of them has to do with parataxis and things not counting in an orderly sense, the section numbers one and two, is that possible? I think it, yeah, it has to, in part based on what Ron just said about how section two, I guess, kind of, you could make a case for it following section one, but really it seems to be doing something on its own. And in fact, it seems to be leading somewhere else, like as cushy clouds in full sun are taken, where's the other part of that equation, as? And so the title count is in a way literally counting these sections, section one and section two, but, and this is something I think of as running across a lot of Ray Armentrout's work, there seems to be a lot else that could be said here that is not said, we mm. get to fill it in. Tracy, can you and I play a game? We're gonna do just back and forth, each taking a turn on the many different definitions or connotations of count <laughs> you first, and then I'll go. Um, count down. Count down. Um, I want to say count as in matters. It matters. It counts. Your turn. Uh, uh, royal, a lower royal. Whoa. I don't know if that's relevant, but I love that. <laughs> Maybe it is, actually. Well, I don't know. Obviously, Count Chocla. 
And <gasps> the count. I was just this off camera imitating the count. Um, but it's not, the poem is not the count. And I think we should reveal in a meta moment what happened before the camera started rolling. We had a copy, a corrupted copy that the title of which was The Count, and we needed to check. And so somebody in the other room, Liz Willis, the poet, called Ray. On the telephone. On the telephone. <laughs> While in this room, Ron looked back at his email and saw the original draft. I mean, are we the right Ron people Ray. to be talking about Ray Armstrong <laughs> poem or what? So Count There might work, as in The Count. Yeah, but also, but also, like honestly, in the imagination you, when you think of count there's only un, uh, one other word you think of that normally comes after that and that is dracula you mm, know mm. so and the mention of kids and, in the and first sweetener. And, sweetener and sweetener so i like it okay i'm gonna do one oh, yeah good no go ahead well count also in terms of grammar count is a verb count is mm, a, yeah. a command count mm. you count now mm -hmm. yeah yeah um, yeah yeah as in you do the counting but also you matter well you that know. leads me to my final piece of this little game and then i'll just turn it back to you and you can say what you want about the first stanza but the children learning right there are two things that little kids learn and generally there are a lot of things they learn but there are two <laughs> two categories of learning one is to count and the other is the alphabet yeah. so there's language and numbers and here we seem to refer to, it's not clear what we're referring to, mm -hmm. but they have, to, they have to learn to something. Mm -hmm. And count is one of those things that kids learn. So I just, I think of it as, as that. Okay, Tracy, now you lead. Where are we gonna go with this? Because we haven't really talked about what these two sections mean. Yeah. I, we haven't I, tried to paraphrase them or anything. Well, you, 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 you helped I think a lot with a segue by asking the different ways of thinking about count because I'm also thinking about the homonyms of one and two. So if, if it's one as in the number one and one as in the pronoun, right? Mm -hmm. One, the future is a sweetener. Children have to learn to crave. Two, as cushy clouds in full sun are taken to be token. So it's not just a, a device to delineate, it's also that the, the one is followed by the, which is a singular for the future, and two predates a plural, cushy clouds, right? Mm -hmm. So the one could be the one is the future, and the two could be the, the, the cushy clouds as two clouds. So, but I want to play a game with you. Wait a minute, that was really cool what you just said. So the I counting is a game in a way. So if you have to do one, you create an image, and if you have to do two, you can create like two cushy clouds. Right. I mean, and if there were three and four, it really is the count. Yes, and now I want to play a game with you. Oh no! And the game with you is, let's let's recount the count. So let's say let's use the position of the lines and see what poem they make. So that would be one: the future as cushy clouds. Mm. is a sweetener in full sun. Mm. Children have to learn are taken mm. to crave to be token. Whoa. So the subtext of the joke about Dracula is actually interesting because the craving of the blood of innocence is part of that mythology. So that's part of the play we could say, right? But also the future as, as, as cushy clouds is one of the ways in which she is saying that's how you teach children to defer by making them think that the future is, that the future is sweet enough to wait for as opposed to just being in the present right mm -hmm. and that children have to learn that so they're deferring their craving right you're blowing my mind am i this is not this is not fair no there's so much Simone, you just said so much <laughs> Uh, and I'm turning to you, but I, I'm going to say what I, what is blowing my mind. No, it's a good game. Okay. Yeah, I'm having a hard time. No, no, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. You're fine. The future is a sweetener. I see something. Talk me out of this. I see something that's a little sinister that Ray is worried mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. And Ray's been writing a lot of poems about little kids. I assume these are grandkids, you know, in in autobiographical sense. A lot of kids in the poems he says, and she's doing a lot of observing as you know parents of young children and grandparents do. The future is a sweetener children have to learn to crave. So sweeteners, you know, 
it's you think that the natural state of craving for children is the sweet thing. Sure. Makes me think of Count Chocula, but that's another <laughs> completely other thing. Um, have to learn to crave. That's a bad thing, right? And Ugh. yet, no, okay, it's a good thing, unless you really, unless you have a really good dentist. poems are always about desire. Come on. Okay, they're about desire, <laughs> but is it a good thing for the future to be one of those things that children want in the sense of a sweetener, a lure, like, mm. come on, here's some candy, let's go to the future together. That just mm. seems really creepy to me, and I'm hoping that we can turn that around and that, that Ray is concerned about that future. Yes. Anna and then Ron. I know Ron wants to say something. Let's go to Anna first and then Ron. Uh, as the parent of a toddler who's um, very aware Who likes sweeteners. Of, very aware of what things are sweet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about the ways that she has learned language and has also learned about things like the future. Yeah. So she's like super aware of routines, what is happening, what's true right now, and also like what's going to be true in the future. She's like, at that age, we're starting to be aware of those things, right? So the other day, it was cloudy, and she said, oh, it's supposed to rain. <laughs> because she's learned at this point, she knows that expression, it's supposed to rain. And she knows now to associate like the clouds looking a certain way with it's supposed to rain. Mm -hmm. So I look at this. I look at these two stanzas and I think about the ways that children learn words for things before they really understand what those things mean. Mm -hmm. And this might be as much about language acquisition and like cultural acquisition, the ways that she's like starting to learn idiomatic phrases right now, as much as it is about the sinister thing that you're reading, which I confess I don't totally see. But maybe that's just because I really love my kid. Oh. <laughs> and she's really sweet. And I don't want to think about anything bad. <laughs> that is fair enough. Ron, help us out here. Uh, OK. Um, my, some of my privileged information, of course, is that Ray's grandkids are twins. Um, <laughs> so, you know, they're like they're, so parent. language acquisition and appropriation are complicated. All right, well, that, that, that explains the two then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think the most interesting and term then, in this right. poem is betoken, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because one of the things kids learn to do as they anticipate the future and begin to learn that they can anticipate anything, mm. that everything is an occasion for anticipation, is you see the clouds and soon they're going to be a duck or a lion or a whale. There, there's an entire Japanese, t uh, Korean, I take it back, a television series, Extraordinary Attorney Wu, in which uh, clouds are whales every single episode. Uh, and even coming into courtrooms and churches uh, in, in those terms. Um, but it's, you learn to look at the clouds. You see the clouds as, as, as we adults see them, as just, you know, moisture in the air. But if you're a kid, you can begin to immediately anticipate what is that cloud going so to turn into. So of the future. Right, and, and they're part of that. We're learning to crave, we're learning to anticipate. Anything that I say will mean something, but maybe not till tomorrow. Um, and, and all of that is, is part of that learning to crave, okay. which is a, really, a, as, as I was saying, that is about desire. Joy Block. Let's turn to the second one. I think we're getting somewhere here, okay. by the way. Um, the passive voice suggests that we need to think about who is taking these cloud formations, the forms and symbols, mm -hmm. the objects that they are to be. Um, we have to decide who is taking them, possibly the children. This is the implication of what Ron is saying. But why in the passive? Well, I think I need a second to figure out why in the passive, because first I want to say all of a sudden I'm starting to read this poem as one about climate catastrophe <laughs> mm -hmm. and the future. It, it almost, I'm, I'm 
I'm feeling very tempted to read it as because I, I sorry, I know so you asked the, me about part two. No, that's all right. But this, you're going this, with my sinister reading. This because have the to, children are going to have to learn. This have to. Yeah, this yeah, like imperative. Scary. Like we yeah. really need the kids to learn to crave the future. Yeah. Right. I mean, if mm -hmm. if we're going to survive, if things on this planet are going to survive, that we need the children to crave a, a future that is a sweetener. It's not itself sweet, but it itself is sweetens other things. Oh, so then man, you, now I see it. I know. So when, then when <laughs> oh, you get yeah. to, I know. <laughs> and so then when you get to part two, as cushy clouds in full sun are taken to betoken, yeah, why is it in passive voice? I mean, is it because we, the, I don't know, presumably grown up <laughs> speaker of the poem, um, have a different relationship to the future, maybe. So, or wow. Yeah. Can I? Can I? Just, Al then Tracy. <laughs> Al then Tracy. <laughs> he said. Al said. <laughs> what kind of moderation yourself. is that? <laughs> Al then Tracy. Convened yourself. Yeah, I convened myself. Fair I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm no, sorry. no. Everything is sad and sinister. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, full sun. Should be clear skies, you know, blue skies, nothing but blue sky. From now on, it's the opposite of that because there are cushy clouds right in the middle of it and they betoken M dash. They betoken. Yeah, exactly. Ah, they betoken, okay, and it's going to be not me, the elder poet with my grandkids, but you guys are going to have to decide what they betoken. This poem's not going to tell you. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, Tracy, I, Julia, your your comment inspired me to look at this a little differently. In your interpretation of of Al's game, uh, I'm counting on you as a as a directive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I don't know how passive it is because I think the second stanza is a directive. Children have to learn to crave. Yeah, and the reason I say that is because it's an iambic pentameter, and all mm. of the rest of it is not. Children have to learn to crave, mm -hmm. so yes. it's a it is a directive, right? And that's the only it's it's and it Ray shows gets... that it's not sweet. It says that the future is not sweet because yeah. it's because it's so directive that if it was a sweet, why would you have to force somebody? To it's create? meta directive. That is to say, yeah. if yeah. I, uh, right. Ray saying okay. if I have to be directive, it's not going to be what you guys are going to have to know what is betokened by these clouds. Yeah. If I'm going to be directive, it's to try to tell you you're going to have Not to learn time. how to want this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Ray, at least the it's early, not early, not Ray of the early poems hated iambic as a symbol of Frostian definitiveness. And this mm -hmm. is so when you see iambic there, you know that she's on alert. All right, we're going to do final thoughts, all five of us. Who wants to go first? Ron, do you have a final thought? Um, you know, Ray, um, I think, writes with a finer sensibility word to word than any other poet of my generation. Um, and it's one of the things about her that um, continues to be awe-inspiring. It's like... 50 years of reading Ray Armand Trout's poems, I have not nearly had enough. Mm. Uh -oh. Well said. That could have been the last final word, but it was the first final word, but that's cool. Anna, final thought? Um, my always favorite thing about reading Ray Armand Trout's poems is the, um, the little twists that she makes, um, the sort of slightly une the, the unexpected. Um, and for me, it's, it's in this first section, the idea that, um, you know, we're, we're programmed to like sweet things, like biologically speaking, you know, mm -hmm. your body wants the sweet thing, wants the sort of caloric cushion, mm -hmm. um, because we don't actually know where our, our bodies don't actually yeah. know where our next meal is coming from. Yeah. Like we don't actually know that for sure. So right. sweet is something that we're supposed to always crave and always be like looking for. So immediately, uh, our alarm bells have to be going off if we have to learn to crave something sweet. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I was just being resistant but, to the sinister yes, reading, no, but I I'm I'm fully persuaded if by I may Julia's say, reading. Though, there is a there is sweet's the wrong word. 
there is a positivity here uh, in a grandparental or parental way because sure. it's not simply dangling sweets. Come on to the future, kids. And I'll, you know, like follow the sweets. It's more like carrot rather than stick. Sure. It's more like I need you to I need you to think about the future. You need to come along, and you're going to decide what it tokens. But and, I got I got word, the carrot. And it's the word not punitive. A it's a non-punitive mm -hmm. yeah. poem about climate change or about the disaster that that awaits the children and not us, actually, right. if, well, I, and, and if I may. The word learn implies that there's a teacher there too. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Implies so, the presence of someone who's yeah. responsible for this lesson. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yes. hopefully that's us. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, I just, it, it's about making room for both, right? It's about the simple, relatively like unadorned oh. pleasure of teaching a toddler what it means to, that it's not raining right now, it might rain later. <laughs> Here's what later <laughs> means. Like there's this beautiful moment um, and there's this bigger context that is, you know, has a gravity to it um, that might not necessarily pop up in those little um, instants, but they have a relationship to each other. So it's, it's a both and thing for me. Mm. Tracy? Yeah, I think each each section of each stanza, it creates a sort of a scale, it balances. And so the hopefulness, I think, is, is in the in-between, is in the negative space between stanzas. Because they could have just been one, two blocks, and then the inevitability and of the sinisterism we couldn't really get out of, right? Mm -hmm. But because there is this space between, to quote F Etheridge Knight, we feel that it's going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And in that, there's hope. And also the outstretched arm is that you physicalize with the M dash. Yeah. It, it sounds directive, but it's still open space. Yeah. And to, to say more about that, the um, hope is that the reader will do the work, maybe a young reader will do the work. And that is the only way that we're going to get out of this fix that we're in. Mm -hmm. You can't have a directive from an older generation. You have to have some kind of open-endedness, thus the dash. The dash is hoping for a grammatical object that mm -hmm the reader is gonna to have to provide mm -hmm. in a Dickinsonian sense. Mm -hmm. I have two two thoughts, actually that was one. Count them, I have three, three thoughts. <laughs> uh, I just say, said the one, ah, ah, ah. Um, I raised kids too. Um, first thought is there's this horrible, sorry, sorry for those who are fans, horrible experiment that was done, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago with the marshmallows at Harvard. Yes, yeah. I'm and I'm not a fan of that. So what they do is they give kids, they say you can have, I, I, tell me if I'm wrong about this, you can have one marshmallow now or you can have two if you wait or whatever. Oh, it's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, an, it's a deference, an accumulation thing, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the, everybody who reads about this thinks, oh, those kids who take the marshmallow now, you know, they can't build for no the future. Control. No input. Yeah. What's wrong with these kids, this generation? I think Ray's kind of on the side of eating the marshmallow. <laughs> I mean, marshmallow is not a positive thing. It's awful for you. But that's the sweetener. Like, yeah. you need to take now what we have to give you because we ain't going to be around to give you marshmallows too much longer. And so don't hold on to them because now is the time. Now is the time. And my second thought mm -hmm. is what Ray told us on the phone when we went into the other room and said, <laughs> Ray, what's the name of this title of this poem? And what about the M dash? Is that really an M dash? And she confirmed those two things. And she said, oh, I'm really glad you're talking about this poem. Why? Because no one talks about this poem. It's really hard, but I really like it. Oh, how nice. And I I'm really feel good that we chose this poem because <laughs> Ray obviously thinks it needs to be talked about. So thank you, Ron, Anna, Julia, Tracy. Thank you, Al. Thank you.